On a hot day, there is a simple joy of finding a nice cold glass or a bottle of water, someone giving you one. This is Norwegian water. It says, says so on the label, and you know what it tastes like? Water. But uh, it's a gift. If you're hot and sweating and I find you and I give you a big old bottle of water, it's a gift. What if I add something to it? Charlie, can you hold this for me? You just hold it right there. And can you hold this over the water? You're in two hands. I know, it's complicated. You didn't see this coming either. Is it a gift anymore? You thirsty? You want something to drink? Eh? Not so much, is it? Looks like water, kind of. Not really a gift though now, is it, if I find you thirsty? Paul is talking about receiving gifts this day. He's talking about, uh, if you read along in verse 6, is therefore, look at the verbs, is therefore you have received Jesus Christ the Lord. Have you have been firmly rooted? You have been established in your faith as you have been instructed, right? The verbs there are all, all about receiving. As Paul has given something to you on behalf of Jesus Christ, you have this, this image of Paul, who uh, we skipped a few verses. Last week we ended two-thirds of the way through chapter one. We pick up now, having skipped over, uh, Paul talked about how much uh, he, he values being able to suffer for the good of bringing other people, giving them this good news. And so we're skipping over that just to continue to look at this, this theme uh, of how they receive. Right? Last week we talked about how we receive uh, as, as a gift. And we're looking at this today. Paul continues, as you have received, as you are rooted in, as you are established in, as you are instructed, as this is this gift that has been offered to you, the gift of Jesus Christ, that, that's what the church is, receives. Having received the gospel of Jesus, Paul is worried that something else is happening. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. Now, if you think about the church listening to this for the first time, that Paul has introduced himself, hey, grace to you in peace, and, and, and you are receiving all that God has given to you, and then you get this warning, you are being taken captive. Like, if I warned you right now, be wary, because you might be taken captive. I mean, I'd be looking around. What? Being taken captive by what? Like, you talk about being taken captive, that's kind of a, a that's scary and shocking language. It, it sounds, starts to sound like someone's being taken hostage, taken captive. Imagine people, people reading this, this would get their attention. And what Paul says they're being taken captive by is empty deception. Lies. Someone is lying to you and it's going to mess you up badly. You are being lied to. And so Paul then reminds them, what, what have you been taught? What have you received? What have you been rooted in and instructed in? Here is what you have been given. Here is the truth. He reminds them. Verse 9. For in him all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. Which is his somewhat complicated way of saying, if you want to know God, it's all in Jesus. All you need to know about God, the fullness of the deity, is in Jesus. Verse 10, and in him you have been made complete. He is the head over all rule and authority. Right? In him you have everything you need. There is no other authority that can tell you otherwise. Verse 11, and in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. You're baptized. You're in. That's it. Done deal. You don't have to seek anything you have already received and are continuing to receive all that you need. You have been baptized. And when you were dead, verse 13, in your transgressions 
He made you alive with him, having canceled out debt consisting of decrees against us, any list of everything you've messed up that has all been nailed to the cross, in which he disarmed the rulers and the authorities, made a public display of them. All debt, all, debt, all guilt, all shame, any list of anything you've ever done wrong has been forgiven, having been nailed to the cross where Jesus triumphs over it, having said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. So this is what you have been offered. This is the, the gospel, right? This is what uh, Paul has taught them. This is the gift that we have also been given. And so we are being warned, don't fall for and be deceived by anyone who wants to help to clarify and in doing so add to this. Well, you've just been told, that's it, that's the gospel. And you add anything else to it, you're adding gas to your water, right? And it's not going to be worth the drinking. Now, what is it that they are being offered that is, what's confusing the matter here, right? Uh, what they're being offered is that let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. What's happening here is they are being told, if you follow Jesus, that's good, and then you need to do this, right? That, that's the challenge here, is Jesus plus something. Well, let me, in the same way that adding gas to water destroys it, like this has gone from being a gift, you're thirsty, here I got some water to you. So now, now it is worse than water. Now if I give this to you, and you're thirsty, it's worse than water, you're better off not drinking than to drink this. In the same way, if you add anything to the gospel, if you start going through these things that Paul warns them about, they're being offered, if you add anything to Jesus, you're worse off than being offered nothing. Jesus equals salvation. If you want to think of this as an algebra formulation, Jesus equals salvation. Jesus plus anything else equals nothing. Right? If you add anything to Jesus, better off not. Right? Jesus plus anything is nothing. The quickest way to completely whiff on the gospel is to add to it. Jesus is salvation. You don't have to add anything else. Right? It's like adding gas to your water. And so here's what they're being tempted to add. Therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Right? Here's Jesus. Here is salvation. And you need to eat a certain way. Or here is Jesus, here is salvation, and you need to worship a certain way. Or here is Jesus, here is salvation, and you got to go to these events. No. Just Jesus. Verse 18. Let no one keep, no, let no one keep defrauding of, you, of your prize by delighting in self-abasement. Self-abasement is a nice way of saying don't have fun, right? You can follow Jesus, salvation, here is Jesus, and you're saved as long as you don't have fun. No fun, right? You are saved, Jesus plus no fun, no, 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 that's, Paul waves that off too. Continue as an 18. Let no one defraud you by insisting on the worship of angels, taking stands on visions seen, inflated without cause by the fleshly mind. The argument here is that people are saying, you are saved as long as you have Jesus and this special knowledge that I will give you. You seek out more knowledge from the angels or there's a special visions you have to have. Salvation is Jesus plus these other things to which Paul says no. And we are still tempted by these things today. These are not, these temptations do not go away, right? You, um, excuse me. you have to meet to have this idea to have certain criteria about how to, how to be Christian, right? You, you can be Christian, you can, have, you can be saved if you follow Jesus and sing the songs, right? You're only Christian if you sing the right music and, and worship, right? You're only Christian if you follow Jesus and you pray the right way. You're only Christian if you follow Jesus and, and you do the right things on Sunday or you go to the right festivals or you worship in the correct way, right? Anyone ever get uptight about how we worship? Yep, you know what that is? Nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is Jesus. Jesus plus any other aspect of how you worship, bleh, right? It's just Jesus. In the same way, uh, the whole association of, of self-abasement. Christians have this wonderful reputation of being no fun, right? 
The idea that you can be Christian as long as you never laugh about it. Right? You, can be, you can be Christian and be saved as long as you don't have any joy or laughter. We are in a no-fun zone here. We're worshiping. We are not allowed to have fun. because We have to be serious because it is ser serious business. You can be saved if you follow Jesus and you're always serious about it. Yeah, whatever. Right? That, no, you are saved if you accept Jesus. That's it. You don't have to be serious. And in fact, if you're always serious about it, there's probably a problem. And if my wife is thinking that applies to you, Andy, she's right. That, that's my personal temptation. I'm always a little bit too serious. Sorry. But this other temptation, right? You can, the, the third temptation he lists that uh, you can be saved. Salvation is Jesus plus special knowledge that you seek from angels, right? This temptation to try to figure out what's really going on. Right? You can f be saved if you follow Jesus and you keep on looking because there's, there's got to be something more complicated. There's something else that's really going on. So keep on looking. No, salvation is Jesus. That's it. If you add anything else to it, it's like adding gas to your water. It doesn't get you anywhere. And I know that I have to be reminded of this often. Right? I, I, I have to be reminded of this often. Because we have to be reminded that we receive this. We receive what Jesus offers. Jesus offers us forgiveness and then says, follow me, and we head towards his kingdom. That's it. That's, you want the short version? That's what it is. Jesus forgives us, we follow him, we head towards his kingdom. And, and that is all a gift. And if we are left by ourselves and we're not reminded of that constantly, what do we come up with? Policies and laws and rules. If we're going to be Christian, then we need to do A and B and C and D. And here's how we're going to act together, or else we're not Christian. We are tempted to convert what is a gift into a set of tasks, which then allow us to do those tasks, to put them on a to-do list and be able to evaluate how we're doing and then evaluate others by how they're doing as well, because there's the other temptation. Because if we convert the gospel into a set of tasks, then I can tell you how good I'm doing and if I'm doing better than you. Isn't that true, right? Jesus, not Jesus and anything else. It's just Jesus. And, and the danger here is that if I walked up to you and I said, I have a gift for you and I handed you this, you thirsty? Here, right? It looks a lot like water. Maybe you may put some lemonade in it. I don't know. But you just take a hit of, off of it, wouldn't you? If I offer you something that is not the gospel and I offer it to you as a gift, but it is actually this, I'm not helping you, am I? This is the danger when we go out to invite people. Because we have to invite people and offer them the gift of Jesus. And that's it. It can't be Jesus. Here, we'll give you Jesus as long as you show up and act like us. We'll offer you Jesus as long as you behave like us. We'll offer you Jesus as long as you tow our line. Nope. That's not the gospel. Jesus plus anything is nothing. We just offer Jesus. You are forgiven. Let's walk together towards the kingdom. That's it. Because if we add to it, if we dilute it, right? What brings us together is that we have each been offered and accepted the gift of Jesus Christ. Everything else is secondary, and that is as much true today as, was, as it was when Paul first put pen to paper. And it is just as tempting to stray. It is just as tempting. The challenge comes in believing and having faith that when people accept Jesus, if you accept Jesus, the, te the challenge is, is to believe that in following Jesus, your life will be transformed and that it's not my problem to change your life. All right? If we follow Jesus together, what we hold each other accountable is that we're going to follow Jesus together. You don't have to act like me or behave like me. We're just going to follow Jesus together and to believe that that's how it works. To practice this, to offer Jesus alone and to believe and know that it is enough is salvation. And if we add to it, we dilute the gospel, and we're not offering people water, we're offering people something far worse. As we accept Jesus and offer this gift to others, that leads then to this interesting situation. Whenever you're gathered in a room of people who are following Jesus together, and if Jesus is what you agree on, do you agree on everything else? 
Nope. Right? And so there seems to be three ways that we can respond to when we're in the room, we follow Jesus together, and we're different on everything else. Here's, here's what tends to happen. Either first, we tend to pretend that everyone thinks like we do. Because I'm right. Right? You ever get that moment where you're talking to someone, you're getting to know them, and you like them, and you're getting along, and you're talking to them, and then they say something that you think, wow, that's wrong. How could they be wrong? Like, I like them. They must think like me. I'm right. And they... And you're confused on what to say, right? That's how we can respond. If we're all, we all follow Jesus together and we're different in a lot of other ways, we can either pretend everyone thinks like us, which ends up being surprised. Two, we can insist that everyone thinks like us, because I'm right. You all should think exactly like I do, because I'm right, right? No. <laughs> I follow Jesus, you follow Jesus, we'll argue about the rest, it'll be great, right? We can, we can then argue about the rest. That can be the second way to approach it. The third way to approach it, and this I think is what ends up being healthiest, is we acknowledge that we follow Jesus together and the rest is up for grabs. And let's celebrate that. Y'all are different from me. Y'all are different from each other. Your differences can either be a burden or a problem or a gift. You have to decide. We offer Jesus, we have each accepted Jesus, and the rest is something that we're going to have to learn to celebrate. We are very different from each other, and that is okay. We offer Jesus, and that is what binds us together, is that we have accepted what he offers. I pray that we can trust that in following Jesus together, we believe that that will transform us as we head towards his kingdom, and that when we go out to offer Jesus to, to others, we offer them water. Not this. Amen.